Uh, excellent. Oh, well, look, thank you very much indeed to everybody for joining us today. I know it's increasingly difficult to um, find time in the middle of the day during the week. Now we're all back at work. Um, but welcome to the next in the series of Ground Source Heat Pump Association lunchtime webinars. Um, my name is Bean Beanland. I am the current chairman. Um, not for much longer though. Uh, my term of office will end shortly. Uh, and I'm very pleased today to welcome Shane McDonald uh, from Calibrate to give us some insights into uh, some agricultural applications um, and particularly the potential to combine uh, heating and cooling uh, for maximum efficiency. Um, uh, next week, uh, we have, uh, we're, we're waiting to announce the topic for next week, so please keep an eye out on usual channels. Um, and remember that all of our webinars are available through the YouTube channel. Um, details of that are available through the Ground Source Heat Pump Association uh, website. So uh, without uh, any more ado, um, Shane, I'm going to hand over to you and we're going to look forward to a very interesting delivery. Uh, as usual, please, if you can post questions in the chat function and we will uh, look to pick up as many of those as we possibly can uh, after Shane has finished his delivery. So, Shane, uh, over you go. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Bean, and thank you to uh, everyone for coming along to learn a little bit about uh, what we've got going on with the business. Uh, my name's Shane McDonald. Uh, I run a company called Calibrate Energy. We have uh, 25 full-time staff, um, one factory existing. We've got another one coming online very quickly in the next few months, and we predominantly focus on megawatt and above heating and chilling systems. Uh, I grew up in uh, a farming background in New Zealand and uh, decided to get into refrigeration because it's something that I was quite passionate about, the engineering that's involved uh, 24 years ago now. So I have quite an in-depth understanding of how uh, refrigeration can re react under various stresses and strains because I've been out there fixing them for two decades and I've worked on the controls now so our company is very big on uh, providing an, a global solution using the software which we write in-house so uh, we have a real leaning towards the global picture of a project it's not just about the heat pump it's about how much the fans are costing to run how much chilling they're saving Everything's tracked in real time, so we can balance their power, we can balance their heating, their chilling. Uh, you know, we really focus in on, on giving that full and depth range of, of knowledge and data. Uh, we've had a bit of a vision for the last few years, uh, particularly the last five years. This is year 15 for us in business, but the last five years has been to create multiple revenue streams within the business. So we are not only telling our clients to do this uh, technology, we've also got our own heat pumps doing various outlets. Uh, we've got a briquette manufacturing plant where we, we dry waste sawdust and products and turn them into a usable, burnable product to replace coal. We have a, a dairy farm. We've got one of our systems on that does all the chilling and the heating rain drying systems which we own and operate. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff going out throughout the country. Uh, about me, my passions when I'm not working all over the country, I've got a very young family, I've got three children under six, which is quite challenging. Uh, I, I love my vintage Venduro motocross riding, which is pre-1997 racing, which is, which is quite interesting. I love skiing and shooting and just basically anything outside. I just love being outdoors and uh, you know, I, I find it was quite relaxing after full-on workload that I deal with. So that's me. Um, what is Calibrate? Calibrate Energy Engineering, it's, it's the culmination of two businesses spanning the last 15 years, uh, focusing primarily on sort of the, the thousand kilowatt, uh, you know, heat pump systems. We've done everything from your variable refrigerant volumes and big, you know, 10 story buildings through to now what we're doing is primarily in the the dairy sector, the potato sector, and the grain sector, where we're just maximizing the reduction on fossil fuels, really, uh, with a strong bias towards chilling. So it, for me, it's very easy to create a heat pump heating system. It's quite complex to control the heating at the same time that you're trying to control the chilling, because they're two opposing forces. So we're always looking for the chilling option. We currently install about 15 megawatts per annum, um, at the moment, we've just finished a 3.1 megawatt system. 
we're installing a 6.2 megawatt system and we're about to go into two two megawatt systems and they're all potato stores dairy farmers grain dryers all seriously focusing on the chilling aspect uh, of, of the process uh, we modulize everything we we don't go to site and just and plonk in a heat pump and, and pipe it up and put the pumps it all arrives complete uh, we, we have a factory in Durham and another one coming online in North Northumberland very shortly to handle our workload. So for instance, a one megawatt system would arrive in a 40 foot container with the heat pumps, all the wiring, uh, heat meters, everything completely done. All, all, you know, all tested, it's pretty much bolted on to the existing infrastructure and away it goes. Our bigger systems, our 3.1 megawatts, we build them onto big steel frame skids so they can be anywhere from four meters wide to eight meters long and weigh sort of 20 tons so you know we have we have a lot of knowledge around uh, how to modulize after the last four four or five years of you know intensively doing it all our equipment stainless steel we predominantly get you know wilo pumps all the stuff that you can buy off the shelf so if something happens it's, it's a quick turnaround. We, we rationalize all our pumps, so all our flow pumps are the same size across our site, so we can service them quickly and, and replace them, swap them out pretty fast. Uh, Software-wise, we write all our controls in-house. Um, we've been doing this for a very long time now, you know, over a decade. We've got it down to a fairly fine art. We can manage our chilling down to about negative six on most systems and, you know, 45 on the heating. Uh, and we focus really heavily on variable demand. So that's variable, de variable demand on the, the flow of the water and also the out of the heating or the chilling. There's a, there's a lot going on there and there's no way to manually do that. It, it has to be automated. You can't have someone just sitting there all day adjusting. So to us, the key, the key win is really the software. Um, our next phase in the business is we have some 50 megawatts of control power under our uh, remit now, which we manage for our clients. So the next part is, is demand side response and power balancing. You know, I think looking towards the next couple of years, based on what we're seeing throughout the year, uh, throughout the world, sorry, it, it is balancing that indirect power of the wind turbine on someone's farm to run the heat pump on another farm. And being the middle person in that, I think is quite critical. Uh, so, our software is already doing it. We've just got to keep pushing forward with that. Uh, we're big on 24 hour monitoring and adjustments and obviously maximizing the tariffs and the efficiency. You know, the RHI is, is a fantastic mechanism to you know, encourage people to learn and, and engage with new technology. However, you must be maximizing the back end of the efficiency at the same time. You know, it's no point someone's earning money but it's the savings they can get. So you have to be able to quantify in real time, every second of every day for us, you know, how do we tweak the efficiency? You know, I've been on a site this week, all week commissioning a big, um, it's a big potato store drought farm that are the biggest suppliers of Walker's Crisps. They have 38,000 tons of potatoes and we now control their chilling for the whole site. So we have 37 heat exchange throughout the site and we control each of them independently managing all their chilling needs. So it's a four megawatt system. They're obviously making quite a lot of RHI, but on the other hand, they're saving some quarter of a million in chilling costs. Now, I can assure you with 38,000 tons of potatoes at risk, you know, we better be sure that we're tracking that in real time and we're very fine on it. So we monitor their, you know, their, their flow rates. We monitor their CO2 in their sheds. We give them the whole package. And once I've got their incoming power sorted in the next few months, we'll then take control of balancing out their power for them as well. You know, holding off our cool storage for as long as we can until we get to that point where we've got cheaper power and then ramping up our heat pump to suit the cheaper power. So it's, it's all those little minute detail that gets you from the efficiency of three to 3.5 to fours and the, you know, the holy grail of the 500%. That's what we're always targeting on our sites. And, and I would say, on average, we're sitting at about 4.2 across all our sites. So, you know, we, we are getting there. It just it takes a lot of time to make those minute adjustments. Um, gone through that, all the adjustments we do, we focus primarily on the dairy, the potato and the grain. Um, 
this is a good example of a dairy. So you have the ground source heat pump in the middle. Say you're bringing incoming water at eight degrees on the heating side, you're heating it up uh, to 45 degrees to make it usable for the farmer, washing down their sheds, cleaning their, uh, clean the cows, cleaning the parlor, uh, you know, heating up the hot water, uh, heating the dairy parlor so it doesn't freeze at night. And then conversely, before the uh, chilling network goes into the ground, we're through a plate exchanger, we're capturing the milk flow at 34 degrees and we're chilling it down to five. Some sites are chilling it right down to two, instantaneously, one pass. So rather than the refrigeration on site doing the work, we're landing the milk in the vat already pre-chilled for free. So you can see the benefit of it. We've got quite a few dairy farms. Uh, case study here, Buckley's farm based in Huddersfield. You, you can see all the facts and figures there. Uh, they do about a million litres of milk a week. So they, they bring the milk in en masse, they, they pasteurise it up to 90 degrees, and then we chill it down from that sort of figure all the way down to uh, two degrees with our, with our system. And at the same time, they're heating all their, they've got a lot of cleaning on site, so they heat all their water. Uh, they have a big contract for Waitrose and Lanchester wine, uh, Lanchester, not wine, Lanchester uh, milk. So all the uh, frames that they load all the milk into, they have a massive cleaning bay and they push all those frames, those stainless steel frames through the washing bay, it cleans them so they can put the milk on. Well, that cleaning process we do as part of our system, we provide all the hot water dosing for all that product. And that gives us a constant heat use, which comparatively gives us a constant chilling. So great system, that one there. Uh, heat pump grain drying. So this is, this is where it all started for us, really. It started with the aesthetic uh, floor grain drying system. We did one probably, uh, it would be five and a half, nearly six years ago now, the first one. A uh, big grain dryer in, uh, in Hartlepool, up on the east coast and the northeast. Uh, he had an issue, he just, he just couldn't strip the moisture out of the product quickly enough. Um, so we designed a system whereby we recovered the moisture-laden warm air through a chin coil and then through the heating coil and back underneath the grain. And we monitored that for a couple of years and it just, just worked fantastically, to be fair. It ran consistently at about 500% efficiency. Um, it dried the grain two or three times faster than anything we'd ever seen before, um, primarily based on the chilling. And then the next client was a, a quite a large client up on the borders. Uh, they do 40,000 tonnes of grain on a, um, a tower dryer, which is a left-hand example. So on that one there, you can see very, very simple. On the heating side, we're bringing in the ambient air, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 degrees. We're heating it up to 40, and then the burners are taking it from 40 to 90. Very, very simple. You know, very rudimentary type system. There's, there's thousands of these systems throughout the UK and the world. Uh, the part that actually does the work, though, is the chilling side. So the ambient air comes on to the chilled process coil. It takes the air from, say, 15 degrees moisture laden, and it drops it down to sort of where we're getting eights and six. So what it enabled us to do was it enabled us to change the tower function from being, uh, you know, five or six of the blue, uh, you know, with the arrows there, five or six uh, columns for the cooling to we halved it to three. So we actually sped up that grain drying system from being a 38 tonne an hour to about a 46 to a 48, just with the chilling. And then conversely, the two megawatts of burners, we dialed down one of them, so now it only uses one megawatt of fossils and one megawatt of our heat pump. So that, that system there, that's been in place for about three years now. Um, that client just recently engaged us to put in a 6.2 megawatt system to handle the incoming grain because they've, they've upped their production to about 45 to 50,000 tonnes now. Uh, so we're currently doing an on-floor drying system with them to handle the grain onto the on-floor with a six megawatt and then to take it through to the one megawatt tower dryer. And they've, they've completely removed all fossil fuels. They've turned the burners off this year. They're not even using it. So huge success. And that's led on to probably... I think we're up at about uh, so 18 to 20 big, big, big grain farms we've done now. Um, very, very simple. Uh, I, I love the grain drying systems because they're just they're so simple. They're so easy. There's no, no, no massive software control on them. Uh, they function. They're very balanced in their heating and chilling requirements. So there's hardly any strain on the ground array. Uh, yeah, favorite, favorite sort of projects, my grain ones. 
Uh, that's the study there, West Ancroft case study. You can find all these on our website, by the way. Just go to Calibrate Energy. Uh, it's all there. Um, four to five year payback has actually turned in three to four. I think they've paid it back in about three and a half years, actually. Uh, that 60% that oil reduction this year is probably going to be 85 to 90%. I haven't found out yet because they're still mid-harvest, so I don't know. Uh, the 45 to 50 degrees is now uh, 40 to 45 degrees, and it's it's sitting consistently about 420 efficiency, and the chilling's still at about 325. So the total efficiency on this site, if you take into account the heating and the chilling, is, is over 700%. And that's, you know, for your one kilowatt of energy to get seven and a half uh, kilowatts of heating and chilling, you know, that's that's what we're after. That's that's what we're targeting every single time. So again, at the very beginning, I said, we don't just focus on the heating. The heating is actually the simple part of it. It's the chilling that does a lot of the demand and you have a lot of the savings on. Uh, another one we've really got into uh, now is our potato stores. Um, we run our potato stores. Uh, traditionally, that has been you know, your standard sort of DX coil refrigeration, whereas now we're using obviously a glycol based system. So in effect, running the, the chilled water from the heat pump through, you can see it big there in the red, uh, through the heat exchangers, we're literally just bolting them to the front of the existing potato stores. Uh, so the air from the environment passes through our coil first and then onto the existing coil and it uses the existing fans. So again, very, very easy. It's just, uh, when we've got a demand, a three-way valve spins, pushes the water through the heat exchanger. When we've met the demand, the three-way valve, three valve spins, bypasses the heat exchanger, goes out into the ground array, absorbs the energy, comes back again into the heat pump, and the cycle continues. Uh, quite simple in theory uh, to manage this, uh, both on the heating and the chilling, and keep everything efficient. That's where you need the software attached to it. Um, again, We've probably got, uh, we would have maybe eight sites anywhere from a megawatt to four megawatts running with our, our potato store jobs now. Uh, we've got one in the borders that runs at 99% uptime. So we only design them to do 80% of the load. Um, we say that you should have your, your backup systems to do the other 20%, but the reality is we sit quite often at about 99 anywhere around the 95 to 99 we hardly need the hardly need the primary refrigeration anymore uh, and as we get better and better with our software you know we'll start to have 100 percent i think eventually um i do quite like these potato projects that they're, quite, they're very interesting they're very technically advanced they're, they're quite complex to implement um you know the one I'm at the moment, I'm literally just sitting around the corner from it that I've been commissioning this week. We've got 37 heat exchangers on the chilling side. So the control points on that and the pumps and just trying to keep everything contained and managed within the, the realms of our software ability has been a really, real stretch for us. But I don't think you'll really get bigger than that. That's 14 massive cool stores and, you know, an Alvin Blanche grain dryer and a pre-drying floor and a potato wash plant and a processing facility, you know, that's quite big. And we've managed to get that at about three to 3.3%, um, 330% efficiency just on the heating and about 200% on the chilling. So combined efficiency on that one, sitting at about 450 to 500 with the target of getting it to about 600 in a few months. Keeping in mind, we've only just turned it on really. Uh, so that's another interesting one. Um, this particular case study here is the farm that we've had that got the 99% uptime on. Um, very, very astute, uh, commercially sound farmers uh, that engaged us to do a two megawatt system a, a couple of years ago. And um, that one there is running fantastically. It's, it sits at about 650, what is it? Yeah, it sits at about it's 350 efficiency on the heating and about 300 on the chilling. So total efficiency of that site is about 650. So he has contracts for uh, miscanthus and and uh, and grains and lucerne and he just he has such a high demand for his heating side, which we never thought he would have. Uh, it's such a commodity on this site here. He just he literally can't get enough heat, um, which is quite frustrating because you think when you design it that 
you know, a two megawatt system sounds <coughs> rather large. And actually, as it turns out, he could probably do it twice that. Uh, chilling wise, he's still got lots of capacity. He's still he's got six potato stores, and we can generate you know uh, 1600 kilowatts, and he's probably only using a consistent sort of 400 to 600 kilowatts of chilling. So on this site, we're pushing a lot more into the ground first than we'd like to. Uh, but eventually, I think he'll probably double the size. Of, you know, he'll probably double the size of uh, this farm in the next 10 years. That's that's what happens when they've got something like this. Um, so. Again, we design all our networks that he's got capacity to expand. So on the chilling side, uh, it's not as complex to go back through a reassessment for off gem. So we can add on more cool stores relatively simply on this. Uh, it's the heating side we've got to worry a bit more about. So that's a fantastic site as well. I'm quite happy with that one. Um, that's pretty much it, really. I don't really. We did have a video for you, but unfortunately, I can't upload it on the on that particular farm. So if you go to the website Calibrate Energy, there's a there's a uh, there's a video for uh, the Allens at um, East Western Farm. It's quite neat. It's got all the drone footage of where all the ground arrays are, and it's got a bit of an interview with the farmer that explains their their point of it. Um, oh, just one last thing. I just recall to seeners, we we also. As a company, we design and install these systems and we do the work for the software in-house and we manufacture, et cetera, et cetera. However, our primary driver is actually to maintain the client's equipment for the next 20 years. So each one of these clients I'm discussing now, we have a service level agreement with whereby we fix and maintain everything for a set fee every single year. We literally, we try very hard to make it as hands off as possible. It's not quite always as hands off as we'd like if there's you know certain things they have to do on the site like cleaning and maintaining some aspects of it however the day-to-day -day running of the equipment checking all the faults checking it staying efficiently you know registering the stuff with off gem you know replacing parts when they fail because they're working 24 hours a day that's all on us so we have we cover from Stonehaven in the north to Ipswich to Shrewsbury and everything in between so we have service techs on the road you know all over the place always fixing and maintaining things and you know we always build in from the outset some you know some serious redundancy into our system so where it needs one pump it's got a dual pump head where it needs piping it's stainless steel where it needs a certain amount of something it's got a little bit more you know we've always got like a little bit of redundancy just so when things fail, we don't have to jump in a vehicle and just race around the country. So that's probably an important aspect to us as a company. You know, that will help us survive when the market eventually shifts, which we, we, all, we all can all see it's going now. Uh, so that's it, really. If anyone's got any question, Dean, um, this is some of the questions that the girls in the office thought you might want to ask me. Uh, but let me know, Ben. Any questions? Uh well, I think I think the first point I would make, Shane. Well, firstly, thank you very much indeed for that uh, for that insight. Um, but the first point I think I would make is that you know, all this stuff sort of goes on under the radar, uh, and I think that um, the, the the awareness. I mean, we've always talked about public awareness of heat pump systems as being poor on the domestic front, and it is. Uh, but I think also awareness. Uh, that this sort of scale of use of heat pumps is going on in agriculture, I think is also pretty yeah. low, to be honest. Um, and uh, so I'd be interested, you know, presumably most of your work now comes by word of mouth, but I mean, do you, do you promote this stuff through, you know, is it, is it in Farmers Weekly? Are, are we at, you know, the Royal Show? I mean, where, where, where do farmers go if they want to learn about this stuff? I mean, how do they, how do they find out about you? So it's a very good point, actually. Uh, keeping in mind that this is year 15 for us, so eight years in its current capacity. So we already had some skill set around what it is and how to do it. Uh, our business all comes from the farmer's friend and the farmer's friend's friend and who they went to school with. And that's we do a little bit of marketing in the Agrimart, which is a nationwide sort of north of the country into Scotland. Uh, we do a little bit of search engine work. However, to be honest, it's just an open day. It's keeping the client happy and having an open day. And we try and do, at the beginning of a contract, one of my biggest things with the contract is when you're sitting with the farmer and the farmer wants, inevitably like any human being, a deal just before they sign it. So it's having a little bit in there 
on the basis that they'll invite 20 clients to the open day when you've satisfied them and got it going, personally invite. I find that's probably better than any marketing we've ever done. So when we finish a project, we have an open day, we put on a big massive roast meal of some description, the farmer personally invites 20 of their friends and we inevitably have between 80 and 120 people turn up every single time. And they come from six, eight hours away for the day and they look through the site, they speak to the farmer, they meet all our clients, they meet our greater team and we normally convert maybe 10% of the people that turn up on that day. And that's it really. We don't, interesting. You know, Very interesting. Yeah, it's... Um, lot, lot, lots of lessons there, I think, for the, uh, for the industry as a whole. So thank you very much indeed. So uh, we're beginning to field a couple of questions. Um, so John Findlay, um, uh, you, we, you know John, John was the immediate past know, chair of the association. Um, he's asking about uh, um, the uh, thermal conductivity surveys that you carry out for your horizontal ground rays. And he says, you know, are most of them horizontal? I mean, presuming most of your farmers have got plenty of land. So I guess it is all horizontal, is it? Uh, a bit of a mixture, really. We've got, we've got a real mixture, John. Um, we go back quite a, diff quite a long way. So we get, a, we get a thermal test on every single site. So, we can got, so we, it's just data for us, isn't it? You know, it's not an expensive thing to do. And for the client, it gives them some certainty when you give them the calculation. So here's the calculation based on a real fact. And we, we've just always stuck to that goal. Off-gem like it. The client likes it. We like it so we can actually figure things out. Uh, we have a mixture of, of horizontal ground arrays, boreholes. We've got a lake system at the moment we're doing, which is open um, to a lake, to a big massive pond. We've got a river-based system we're doing at the moment for a castle. Uh, that's, uh, that's taking the water out of a river, which the, the, the authorities have signed off on just recently. So it's, it's a real combination, really. Um, on the back of that, I think the biggest mechanism that Ofgem have allowed us to do is the heat recovery. You know, that's, that's the biggest win we've got. So it's, you know, extracting the energy from the cool store before the product, before the water goes in the ground. So you're never, ever saturating the earth array. That's the, that's the biggest lesson we've learned over the last four or five years. Like we've already, we've always fundamentally understood it. Just now, it's, it's the key to making our system super efficient, is getting that heat recovery component exactly right. So when we're pushing the water on the ground, we can absorb the maximum amount of energy to get the efficiency correct. So in answer, John, there's always a thermal response test. Uh, it's just a combination of projects now. It's a bit of everything, really. Borehole, open, and uh, horizontal. Excellent. Um, I, I, I put up a question about uh, your relationship with the DNOs. You know, one of the one of the issues we have, of course, is getting enough juice to some of these sites. Um, uh, how, how do you find the DNOs' responses? Because I'm I'm guessing in most of these instances you're having to uh, upgrade electricity supply to these sites. Oh, 100 percent of the time, um, it's painful. It's very painful and expensive. Uh, no, no, it's not too bad. It's it's really shifted. So we've got we've got a lot of projects uh, that sort of sit in the, in the sort of Yorkshire up through to Cooper Angus and Aberdeen. That sort of seems to be a lot of our market. And then we've got bubbles popping up in Ipswich and Shrewsbury now. In that part of the world, they're trying to get rid of power, so they've actually shifted slightly. What used to be sort of a three hundred pound three hundred thousand pound connection is now often a sixty thousand pound. That's, what, that's, that's, that's happened in the last 24 months because, as an example, the site that we've got up in, um, in the borders that's doing a six megawatt, that needs a two megawatt connection into it. So when we investigated that three or four years ago, that was in the millions, now it's 350,000. And on a spend of a few million, it's, it's proportionally worth doing. So yeah. they're going to do it. That Whereas is uh, 24 that that's very, that's very interesting. Um, uh, I'd be, only our experience. yeah, I'd be fascinated with, with data because one of the issues we had when the RHI was first announced was, um, uh, that of course the peripheral costs of putting in, um, uh, ground and air source, any sort of heat pump, the peripheral costs were never considered. So in the, uh, yeah. in the analysis, the, uh, Bayes economists looked at the, what they thought was the cost of putting the system in and came up with the tariffs accordingly. But what they failed to recognize is that, you know, some of these sites, we were spending 
tens of thousands of pounds getting just getting electricity supplied to the site and none of that was recognized yeah. so uh very interesting but of course with your with the scale of your payback um uh which which i think probably we won't we won't uh, we won't <laughs> we won't tell off, off joe and bays about um I think uh, they're aware of it. Then the co well, exactly. I think they are. The costs. Uh, the, it's interesting that the costs are are becoming increasingly manageable, which is great. Um, so John has come with a follow up, and he's saying, uh, "What's your prediction for agricultural projects post RHI?" Mm, not good, unfortunately. I think uh, I think it's going to be sub one hundred kilowatt. I think they're going to maximise. Uh, I think it's probably companies like us that have found a way to do a low cost per kilowatt solution, uh, probably, you know, we're not going to be doing it on scale as much anymore. Is that's what I think is going to happen. And I actually, uh, fundamentally, I probably agree with it. I think uh, the future fund should be stretched across more people, not just the larger scale sites. That's how I look at it. So I think it's going to be sub 100. Yeah, no, I think the, I think the question more is, I mean, presumably the, the demands are going to remain. So people are still going to need grain drying systems. They're still going to need chill, chilled storage for, for um, potatoes and other and other um, fruit and vegetables. Um, oh, sorry, so, I misunderstood. Okay. So will the will the will the next will the next client continue to invest in these systems based purely on the savings, um, or is this so dependent upon the RHI? that you will struggle unless something fundamentally happens to the spark gap between the price of fossil fuel and the and the price of electricity so i think it's a lot of later part of your comment i think even with a heavy chill usage i think after the rhi ends it still won't stack up unfortunately which is a shame the only way it will stack up is if fossil fuels rise by about sort of 20 percent so as it stands, there's probably going to be a gap between the end of the scheme and the point where they have to, they're going to be forced to do it re, uh, regardless. Yeah. That's what I think is going to happen. Okay. No, well, that's very interesting because bridging that gap, of course, is the key, uh, the key here. So uh, as a, from an industry perspective, we are concentrating on trying to get to a point where we're subsidy free because subsidies are always a problem. Uh, you know, clearly there are some significant winners. But fundamentally, it always makes, you know, being reliant on government handouts is always a problem. So we need I to agree. get to the point where we're no longer dependent on subsidies. Um, and uh, being able to move sort of industries like this to a point where they're not dependent. So um, one, of the, one of the current uh, developments that I think we're likely to see will be a relatively early move against oil. Uh, yeah. And presumably quite a lot of these sites their fossil fuel is oil rather than gas. Is that fair? Yeah. So, that, so particularly the fundamentally the grain drying uh, sites are predominantly kerosene based oil. So, we're sort of we're hearing murmurs of uh, the Scot the Scottish Parliament changing it that twenty twenty five you can't use kerosene and there's all sorts of things that are sort of going on in the background. So that would then make a heat pump running at 700 percent the obvious choice. So that's that's definitely a market. And your your potato stores where you're maximizing the heating, particularly if it's an arable and a potato store farm, where you can do both the drying of the product and actually run the cool stores, you know, there is a market for that. However, at the moment the cost of the infrastructure to put in like a water based cool store system it's just it's just not quite there yet. It's just a little bit away and mm. it doesn't seem to you know that yeah, it's not quite there yet for the potatoes, but grain drying, dairy farms is another one where it'll exist because you've got a constant chilling and heating use. I think wherever you've got the constant balance of, balance of a heating and a chilling requirement, that's always going to win because your efficiency is through the roof, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you're not just focusing on one aspect, you're doubling up the whole time. Industrial uh, process uh, will be a good one. And, and so in that environment then, if you have a client who has a single purpose, you know, they've either got the heating or the chilling requirement. Um, mm -hmm. Are you going to see, do you think, changes in agricultural practice where it will be, it, it will encourage farmers to look at co-locating different types of agriculture. So they'll say, if, I, if I've if i got this heating requirement over here, 
if I had a chilling requirement as well, um, this system would stack up and we could do some really good things. So actually what I need to look for is a farming practice that requires chilling and bring it onto my site. Is that, do you think we're going to see some movement it's, it's, in the way that farmers manage their, their, their future businesses in that respect? Yeah, I'm seeing it already, actually. So I've got one particular client that they do a lot of grain and their next door neighbours is a big potato farm. So they're actually collaborating on that where the, the one farmer's got the grain drying and he just provides the chilling across, you know, literally across a field through, uh, through the pipe work to a chilling network. So I'm already seeing it in some regards. Um, yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, that's, not, you know, that's ideal because that's, yeah, that is, that's avoiding waste on both sides, isn't it? Yeah, and again, that's why I kept, I probably said it half a dozen times to bore people, but for me, the future all the future of the heat pumps for my field, which is the megawatt and above, has to be the amalgamation of the heating and the chilling. Because yeah. it, it's, it's, it's not going to stack up long term if you just do one without the other. It's just not going to work. It's just the, the cost per capita is still quite high, and we can't yeah. figure out a way to drop it below. So it so has to be both heating and chilling. In terms of business continuity for you then, if there were some mm -hmm. some signs from government, some signals from government that oil was coming under pressure, and at the same time we started to see progressive movement of the environmental levies from electricity to fossil fuels, so the price of electricity comes down and the price of fossil fuel goes up, uh, are those the sort of signals that you think would allow your your current clients and future clients to continue to invest? even if the numbers aren't as good but they can see that the future is is coming and therefore it's it's worth them making the investments now yeah absolutely i've got i've got a whole handful of clients that are just sort of sitting there and for whatever reason they're doing other stuff with their money at this point in time uh but they're still interested and they're still paying attention to what they what we're doing so I think their biggest fear is just the cost of electricity. I hear this every single time because it's the only input cost apart from our service level agreement that they have to worry about. You know, we've kind of fixed the risk as much as possible on it by saying we'll handle all the downside of anything failing. The only thing you need to focus on is your incoming power costs. So Got it. let's, yeah. Get, yeah. let's, get, okay. let's well, get your that, solar system. Um, have we got uh, anybody else amongst the audience with questions, uh, questions they'd like to pose to Shane? Please stick them in the in the chat function. Um, otherwise, I'm going to continue to pick his brain because I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, I, I've got a very per a very pertinent question as of today, actually, Shane, and that is that um, you'll be aware of the latest notification of the net tariff digression kicking in on mm -hmm. the first of uh, October for tariff guarantees. And obviously, all your work is of a scale where it is tariff guarantees. Are, are you going for tariff guarantees at the moment for projects? 100% of the time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, the pertinent question as of today then, and we will be emailing this out, so you don't have to think about this, about answering it now, but um, sure. we will be putting out a survey to members um, uh, either later today or tomorrow that will ask for hard examples of projects that would have gone ahead without the next aggression, but now won't go ahead unless they can get a tariff in, guarantee in before the 1st of October. Do you think that a business like yours has got hard examples of those sorts of projects that will now fall over? Uh, we've already written it up in preparation for you, Bean, because we thought it was coming. So it's some 40 megawatts worth of projects. Very good. So okay, so that question, that question, it's a single question survey, um, and it's very specific uh, about the tariff guarantees. Um, uh, there's a there's a tiny chink of light uh, in this particular oh, wow. uh, uh, case, which is why we're going to pose the question. Don't get excited about it because it's a huge ask. But the fact that the ministry are interested in the question is a uh, is a pertinent point in itself. So um, so be prepared for that. So that's really good that you've given it some thought already. So uh, so that question should be out with you later today or tomorrow. Uh, and that would go to all of our members of both the Ground Source Heat Pump Association and the Heat Pump Federation as well, of course. Um, okay. So, any, anybody else got questions for Shane? Anybody want to raise a hand? I know we've got the hand raising function, or any of the participants want to 
live on the microphone and have a chat with Shane. Uh, pick something in, play something. Uh, don't think I can see any hand waving functions. Um, if uh, if that's the case, then uh, Shane, unless you've got some final thoughts you want to add, uh, we could give everybody 15 minutes of their day back. <laughs> no, I think I've uh, I think I've probably spoken enough. If anyone needs to chat with me. Um... Just get in, get in touch via the function on the website, really. Um, you know, we've got, we've got a lot of people with a lot of knowledge, uh, a lot a lot more clever than I am. So I'm sure if there's anything of any nature that anyone needs help with on a design front or anything, just let us know, really. We've got, we only focus on a certain part of the market. So there's, there's a whole plethora of data you could capture from us, which we're willing to give free of charge. Um, you've just got to ask, really, just get in touch through the website function, ask the question, and um, one of about half a dozen people will, will answer it. So just um, feel free to get in touch, really. Always here to help. That's uh, very generous. Um, Shane, thank you. Uh, really good to hear about a piece of the, uh, a segment of the industry which doesn't get a lot of headlines, but clearly because of its scale is enormously important. So uh, I'm very grateful to you. Thank you very much indeed. I hope everybody online who's... Uh, listening um, found that interesting uh, and I'm sure that we'll see a lot of views of that popping up on um, uh, on the YouTube channel the video will be up on the YouTube channel probably within about 24 hours or so so uh, Shane once again thank you very much indeed and the rest of you enjoy the rest of your day thank you good stuff <laughs>